I'm Tony Ruiz, contributing editor of Gold Derby, here with John Scheinfeld, uh, the director of What the Hell Happened to Blood, Sweat, and Tears, uh, a fascinating documentary about the uh, the uh, famous 1970s uh, band. And and John, I heard you say in, in another interview that you thought that this story was almost like a Shakespearean political thriller rather than a music documentary. Uh, how so? Uh, very much so. It's really about a group of young men who found themselves in a, a situation not of their own making. And they <clears throat> were stuck in between the left wing and the right wing in a polarized America that was as divided in 1970 as we are today. And they had to suffer the consequences of being stuck in the middle. And as a result, they were canceled long before we knew what that term meant. That was the thing that occurred to me as I was watching it in that this really is, I think, a film that is just as much about the idea of canceling um, long before cancel culture was ever a thing. Yeah, very much so. And that's what these young guys, you know, were, were victims of really at the time. And I think what makes it a little more Shakespearean is that there were some interesting elements to this story, including a whole aspect of blackmail, which forced these band members to uh, take on something that they thought would save their career, but in the course of saving it, they killed it. And that's what I think it makes for that Shakespearean element. And I think that for, for, for a younger generation, you know, Blood, Sweat and Tears, you know the songs, but you might not know the name of the band. And I think a lot of people, it, it even dawned on me that this was a band that won the Grammy for Album of the Year over things like Abbey Road and uh, The Fifth Dimension and Johnny Cash and San Quentin. And you're like, well, wait a minute, how come we haven't heard more? And this this really answers that question. Yeah, uh, well, a lot of this is Bobby Columbia's fault. Bobby was the... <laughs> Uh, co-founder of the band and the leader of the band. And he had seen a film I made a few years ago about uh, John Coltrane. Um, and uh, uh, he called me up uh, about a month before COVID hit and said, I want to tell you a story. I want to buy you lunch. So we went to lunch and we're just sort of talking a little bit. And and, and I, I sort of said a similar thing where, you know, I liked the band. I knew I knew the hits that they had. They were as big as you could be in 1970. And then suddenly they weren't. And I asked him, what the hell happened to Blood, Sweat and Tears? He said, that's the story I'm going to tell you. And it was from that that I started to think, you know, this is really fascinating. It's not your basic music documentary, which is a history of the band. The history is almost um, <clears throat> secondary here. What really is important of is, is tracking the events of 1970. Um, not only what happened to the band, but what was going on in the country at the time and in the world at the time, placing them in that and helping to understand context. And then it's what happened to these guys. And, and that's what we're exploring. And that, to me, was an irresistible story uh, that I just had to tell. Well, and the the political intrigue and the Shakespearean kind of aspect, um, it, it to me, that kind of really comes through in the way the film is put together. Was that a conscious decision that you were making in the process? Yes, uh, it really was. Um, when Bobby told, first told me the story, I, I had to do some due diligence uh, because um, he actually only knew a little bit of the story. It's one of those things, you know, it's a Rashomon kind of thing where you can look at something, but you ask four different people who were there, they have four different perspectives on what happened. Bobby only knew a, a little bit, but I was totally fascinated by that. But with every uh, film that I do, uh, I have to ask myself two questions. The first one is, do we have the audiovisual material with which to tell this story properly? And is the story compelling enough, multi-layered enough to be worthy of being on a big screen? Now, once I studied a little bit more about the story in the band, I said, well, absolutely, this story is worthy of being on, on the big screen. And people who do see the film will, will see that there are so many layers to this story. It isn't just, uh, as, as we said uh, before, a music documentary. But the big challenge was, um, is there enough audiovisual material with which to tell the story? Uh, a lot of it centers around the band being the first American rock band to tour behind the Iron Curtain. They went to three communist countries, Yugoslavia, uh, Romania, and Poland, and performed a series of concerts, most of which went very well, except for 
oh, a small little riot in Bucharest, Romania. Um, and it's one of my that's one of my favorite sections of the movie. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's good. And 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 again, you saw uh, one of the things we did was we tracked down some young people that had been at that concert, now much older, and you could just see how impactful that concert was and that event was for them. Um, but in the course of the, the the lunch, Bobby says to me, just like dropped it in casually into conversation. He said, oh, and you know, we took a documentary film crew with us on this tour. I, I'm like, what? There's film on this? And um, we had to track down the film. We knew they shot 65 hours of material, brought it back to Los Angeles, and we're going to edit it into a two hour documentary for uh, theaters across the country. There's a whole story of why that never came out that we tell in the film. And we never did find the 65 hours. But what we did find was uh, a one hour version that had been cut for uh, a potential distribution for television uh, that also never came out. And the way we found this was we had uh, we cast a very wide net, uh, both uh, here in Los Angeles and, and uh, around the world really to see where might this footage have shown up if, if uh, when it left the editing room here in Hollywood? And uh, we checked every independent storage vault in Los Angeles. And it was like, no, 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 don't have it, don't have it, don't have it. And then this lovely woman named Dee Dee uh, ran a vault uh, here in town. And one day it was during COVID, she had nothing to do. And she went through uh, loose leaf binders uh, uh, that had been put together in the 70s. And she found a vague reference uh, to blood, sweat and tears. So the next time she went into the vault, she went to look and sure enough, in a far corner of the vault in a pile of material that was marked for destruction uh, was this one hour version. And so armed with that, I felt comfortable we could proceed to make the film. And it really is the foundation of the film. You really get a sense of what these guys saw and felt and experienced while they were over there. And and yet one of the things that I took from the film as somebody who wasn't as well versed in the band was that I, I don't think that the the tragedy, if you will, of what happened to them would be as profound if it also didn't demonstrate the supreme talent and musicianship of of this group. Was it important to you to have both of those elements in it? Very much so. Uh, I think you wanted to appreciate more. Of, of what they brought to the musical landscape. And by understanding that, you can then understand why what happened to them was so catastrophic for them. Um, and, and I think in every film I do, I try to give enough context. So we're not just telling you what happened. You know, this happened, this happened, this happened. It's we're telling you, how did you feel about it? What was the impact of it happening? And that's what we really see here. And if we couldn't understand the heights that they had reached, we could not appreciate and feel as emotional about the depths that they went to after this story took place. But, you know, uh, uh, Tony, you talk about um, uh, how, how good this band was. Um, we knew again that the documentary film crew had brought with them um, an eight track studio tape machine, not the eight track that people used to have in their cars, but it was an <laughs> eight track studio machine portable. And they recorded all of their concerts. And I thought, well, we need to find these tapes so that we can, uh, really hear just how good this band was on stage. And again, we checked all the independent storage vaults, couldn't find them, couldn't find them, couldn't find them. And then uh, uh, Kathleen uh, Ermitage, who works uh, for me as associate producer, she she by quite accidentally uh, talked to the family of the associate producer of the documentary that didn't happen. And it turns out he had passed away in 2018. So he wasn't able to tell us what was going on but his family donated the contents of a storage vault to the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences here in Los Angeles. And Kathleen prevailed upon uh, the archivist to go down in the basement finally and do an inventory because they hadn't done one. And happily, there were five of these eight track tapes and across the five tapes were all but two of the songs that they performed on the tour. So we took him into the Capitol Record Studios where Frank Sinatra used to record. <clears throat> excuse me, where Frank Sinatra used to record, and uh, Bobby Columbi and this great engineer, Alan Sides, uh, mixed the tapes. And Tony, I will tell you 
this band blows your socks off how good they are. You know, there's a famous ad that came out years ago where a guy's sitting in a chair in front of a speaker and the speaker, the sound just like blows him backward in the chair. That's the experience we all had listening to this band because they are so uh, powerful on stage. You know, it's one of the things that I find so interesting when I talk to documentary filmmakers, you know, each each filmmaker has a different kind of idea in their head and other people kind of say that the film comes together in the editing. Um, did you have, which one of those approaches, did the film kind of come together for you in the editing room or did you always have this kind of structure in your mind? Because there's something very, again, almost like a political thriller approach to it. I'm kind of reminded of like, you know, all the president's men. That was the first thing that came to my head while I was watching it. Wow. Well, I'm flattered by that comparison. That's really nice. Um, I, I find it very irresponsible to go into the editing room without having at least some kind of a roadmap as to where you're going. So um, I will do all my research. I will uh, 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 shoot all my interviews. Uh, armed with that, I then put together a, a draft of the script. And <clears throat> the script is not what a narrator says because I don't use narrators. Um, I have enough unique voices from the people that we interviewed that they drive the narrative. So it's really a question of shaping the story and how it unfolds over uh, uh, the, the, two, the two hours. And um, in this case, uh, I put the story together and largely that's the film that got made. So we went into the editing room to do that. Now, you also have to be really open to things that may come your way, whether it's a piece of film, whether it's a new fact, whether it's a document, uh, whether it's something that somebody says in, in the course of an interview that I, I, I couldn't know because they hadn't said that before. So it's, it's I would say mostly having a roadmap, but it's also being open to, to what you hear that can really help make your story that much more powerful. For example, we interviewed um, the director of this documentary that didn't happen about the tour, a guy named Don Camber who uh, uh, some of your viewers, if they look him up, they will see he is a first class editor who did five easy pieces and Romancing the Stone and a lot of other great films. This was gonna be his first uh, directing uh, uh, job. And uh, he was 90 years old when, uh, we, when we did the interview. He was living in a, a, a assisted living facility in Burbank. And uh, for a long, long time, we couldn't get him out and we couldn't go in because it was COVID. Finally, there was about a three week window and we got him out and he starts to tell us this story that no one else told us. And this is again, one of the other elements of our great story. Uh, it's the uh, Cold War spy element of trying to smuggle the film out of Romania because the government wanted to confiscate and destroy it. Don tells us the whole story because he was there. Even the band members didn't know that. So again, a combination of knowing what happened and being able to allow that to unfold, but also being open to some new things that happened along the way. Because we were already editing when, when we did Don's interview. So we were able to um, insert his sound bites in at the appropriate uh, places. Um, I, I'm curious as to, you know, so many of your films um, have this kind of intersection of, you know, there's sometimes it's music and pop culture and religion and politics and things like that. Um, are you drawn to those types of stories that kind of the, incorporate the different facets of society all at once? Very much so. I think it's, it's a couple of things. Um, uh, one is I always try to find an interesting story that you don't know about somebody or something that is well known. So, um, I did a film called The U.S. versus John Lennon, where it was a very little known story about the political John Lennon, not the Beatle John Lennon. Um, and uh, I, I did a film called Who is Harry Nilsson and Why is Everybody Talking About Him? And it was about a, a singer songwriter that, that some people knew, a lot of people didn't. And it was a lot of unknown stories. So with Blood, Sweat and Tears, here it was a famous band, but as, as we discussed earlier, uh, uh, their fame has not come down to us today. And so it's a really unknown story that illuminated a lot about what was going on uh, in the world at the time. And that's really what I do try to do. So I try to bring in context, uh, whether it's, it's other aspects of what's going on in the world, 
uh, other aspects of, of life in general, pop culture, whatever it might be. Because I think that makes the story much more rich and textured and as, as I said before, multi-layered. Because you really want it to be worthy of being on a big screen so that if people come into the movie theater uh, uh, and they watch it, it's like, oh, wow, this is really interesting. I had no idea. This is, as opposed to a more straight ahead doc, which is just, you know, in 1981, this happened. And in 1991, this happened. I'm less interested in the, those details than I am about the bigger picture story and how do people feel about it? Yeah, in, in, in answering the question that the documentary poses in its title and in its subject matter, um, uh, how does the band feel about it, about what's happened to them? And with all this space and time being able to look back on it, do you, did you, I didn't get the sense of necessarily bitterness or anger. Um, I feel like they had a very kind of healthy view of it. What, what was your takeaway from how the band would answer that question? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, I think they all had a story to tell. I think they were all not angry, not bitter, but sad about what happened to them. I think they, they'd had acceptance uh, over the years, but this was a chance for them to tell their story from their point of view. And I think they really welcomed that. And I think what you saw is an aspect of the wonder of, of a 20, you know, kids in their mid twenties going over to this part of the world. I mean, most of them hadn't been out of the United States and here they are going to three of the most repressive countries in the world. And, and what they saw really educated them. And I think you got a sense of that. But I think you also get a sense from some of them, particularly uh, Bobby Columbi and, and Steve Katz, in addition to the emotional aspects of it, you get a real sense of humor about it, that they can look back at this and, and, and find something to smile at in, in what was essentially a very difficult and complex situation. And I think, again, Tony, what I might say is, is I always try to infuse my films with a healthy sense of humor. I think this is so important. You know, a lot of the first documentary I ever saw was in high school, and it was about the the uh, the mating habits of the tsetse fly in the South Pacific. You know, and it was like really intense and serious, and, and that's what I always thought, sort of thought documentaries were. And you do look at a lot of the documentaries come out to the, today, and they're very serious, thoughtful, smart pieces. But I also feel that to be entertaining really good if you can find some aspects of humor in here. And we were able to do that not only with the uh, the, the uh, recollections of, of the band members and, and Don Camber and, and our other experts, but also some of the film clips that we selected. People are gonna be very surprised, I think, to see a little Rocky and Bullwinkle in this film. And I won't tell you exactly how we used it, but I always like to have somebody say, what the heck is that doing in this film? And there is a point to it, which will become clear as the, as the story unfolds. Well, John, congratulations and congratulations on the uh, Critics' Choice nomination today. Um, uh, thank you. Rich, richly deserved. Uh, everybody go to goldderby.com, make your predictions uh, for the upcoming award season and stay tuned for interviews with more uh, filmmakers and artists over the course of the season. Uh, John Scheinfeld, what the hell happened to Blood, Sweat and Tears? Thank you so much. Thanks for having me, Tony.